Hello, everyone. Welcome again. So glad that you are here with us. And uh, we continue our study through Colossians. I want to say, I love a good mystery story. From way back reading Sherlock Holmes to a little bit more recently, Agatha Christie, or even when I was a kid, Scooby-Doo, and more recently, a series on TV called Psych. Could even be one of those true crime dramas that is considered an unsolved mystery. I really find it intriguing to follow the progress of the story to figure out who done it. I also love the mystery stories in, in nature or in history, like who built Stonehenge and what's it all about? Or what are all these giant holes popping up in Siberia? Articles suck you in with titles like Eight Natural Mysteries That Can't Be Explained. Now, I'm going to ask you not to Google that right now, although you could press pause and, and do so. Um, that is an actual title of an article, and it was actually very cool. I read the article while I was preparing for the sermon, and it sucked me in because there's some freaky stuff out there. If you start reading it, uh, you know, I could easily lose you here for a half hour. Actually, let's talk about a couple of them because they're just so cool. First of all, have you ever heard of star jelly? The article says it's also known as astral jelly, star shot, star slime, star slough, star slubber, and star sludge. Not exactly sure what that means, but speculation, the article says, has ranged to everything from the paranormal to unknown fungi or slime molds to something of an amphibious nature. But no succinct identification has been confirmed by science about this clear jelly that just shows up. Or what about this one? Have you heard of catatumbo lightning? Occurring over a swamp in northwestern Venezuela almost every evening for centuries, this everlasting storm averages 28 strikes per minute in events that last up to 10 hours. When things really get going, lightning strikes every second. Oh, and the lightning is colorful and does not produce thunder. And sometimes then it'll just stop for a few weeks at a time. Or how about the Hestalen lights in Norway? Ever heard of them? This is so cool. They're named for the valley where they occur. Sightings of strange balls of glowing luminosity have been reported there since the 1940s, and some say even into the 19th century. They come in a variety of colors and formations. Sometimes they flash, uh, sometimes they dart around quickly, and sometimes they just hover. At their most active, they appear 10 to 20 times per week. But nobody knows what in the world they are. It's a mystery. Well, as we continue studying Colossians, Paul has a mystery. It's not a mystery in nature, but it is one that he said was hidden for a long, long time. Today, we're going to learn as he reveals the mystery. So last week, the sermon was about this exact same section of verses. You can turn there, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, through chapter 2, verse 5. And last week, we looked at the theme of Paul's apostolic mission of suffering, servanthood, and selflessness. And he said he did it in order to present everyone perfect. Well, this week, we're looking at what he says is a mystery. I'm going to start by reading the passage again so that we can familiarize ourselves and hopefully unravel the mystery that Paul says is so important. Here's what he says. Now, I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, 
struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Did you hear him talk about the mystery? Let's look at verses 26 and 27 there in chapter 1. Paul says he wants the true message of Jesus to be heard. Well, what is that true message? I mean, if he's so concerned about making sure that the true message about Jesus was heard, you'd think he'd go over it with them again. Just as a reminder. Well, I think he does share it with them. In fact, in verses 26 and 27, Paul summarizes the content of this message that he was to proclaim. He was commissioned by God, and he calls it a mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, what does that mean? Have you ever heard of a word called etymology? If you're the kind of person who likes to know where our English words come from, you're an etymologist at heart. Etymology is the study of the history of words. So therefore, the etymology of a certain word is its origin history, where it came from, how it came to be, what it means today. And so etymologists are kind of like word detectives, trying to solve the mystery of where a word came from. What we learn through etymologists is that most of our English words came from other languages. Well, today's passage in in Colossians gives us the etymology of our word mystery. So I guess you could call that the solution to the mystery of the word mystery. Well, in Greek, which Paul wrote in, he uses the word mysterion. You can kind of hear how we get our word mystery from mysterion. They're so similar. But the word over the years, especially in English, has changed in meaning somewhat. When we English thinkers consider the idea of a mystery, we're thinking of a problem or a puzzle that has not been solved or explained. It's a mystery. That's the definition of mystery. Once a mystery has been solved, it ceases to be a mystery anymore. But I suppose we could call it a former mystery, a problem that used to be unsolved, but it now has an explanation. That's really the angle that Paul is getting at here. He clearly says in verse 26 that this mystery was unexplained for a long, long time. But now it's no longer a mystery. Why? Or how? Well, because what used to be a mystery has now been disclosed to the saints. And when Paul says that it has now been disclosed, he's using a word there that refers to like a very detailed, very clear disclosure. It's not vague or foggy or partial. The disclosure is so thorough that it is no longer a mystery. So whatever this mystery is, and he's about to reveal it, there's going to be no mistaking about the identity. It's going to be a full disclosure. And we often use that phrase, in the interest of full disclosure, or we say, in the spirit of full disclosure, when we want people to know something that we think is really pertinent to the discussion. It's information that we're aware of, but the people we're talking to are probably not aware of. And it's not fair that they don't know. In fact, we know that if they knew what we know and they found out, they would be offended that we didn't tell them what we knew. The same goes for this mystery. Paul is saying that God is making a full disclosure of the mystery so we can all know. So, backtrack a bit here to verse 25. There, Paul mentioned that God gave him this commission to present the word of God in fullness. Paul wanted full disclosure of the word of God. That full disclosure, he says, was hidden for a long time, but now it's been revealed to the saints. Who are the saints? 
some kind of secret society that gets to know the mystery? Well, in Roman Catholic belief and practice, it's hard to become a saint. One description I read said this, that to become a saint, one must lead a heroically virtuous life in the strictest accord with the teachings of the church, embracing charity, faith, hope, and other virtues. One must also perform miracles during their life and either be martyred in the name of their religion or be responsible for miracles after death. And then they have this whole process where people can become a saint. It's a big deal. That's not what Paul's talking about. Though we do translate the word he uses here with our English word saint, he's referring to the concept, a concept of people becoming holy, holy ones it could be. And Paul uses this word many times. We saw it back in verse 12 of chapter 1, then again in verse 22, now here in verse 26. And if you scan ahead, he uses it actually a fourth time in chapter 3, verse 12. So think about that. He's used this word three times already in chapter 1, and I find that to be interesting. He's, he's placing an emphasis on this, these holy ones, right here at the beginning of the book. Who are these holy ones? Paul calls the recipients of the letter holy ones. He wants the Colossians to know, these Christians in this town of Colossae, that he is identifying them as part of this group of holy ones. In other words, he's saying true followers of Jesus are considered holy ones. Now, as I was studying this, it really jumped out at me, this concept of holy ones, especially in connection to what we talked about last week, the idea of Christian perfection, which Paul mentions there in verse 28. Whatever this mystery is, if we follow Paul's train of thought, He's saying that he was commissioned by God to present it, to reveal the mystery to these saints, these holy ones, so that he can present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, I get perfect is a different word than holy ones. There are two separate words in how he wrote it. But you can kind of see how the concepts are connected, right? In Christ, we are considered holy in God's eyes. Now, that doesn't mean we've become holy like God is holy. Far from it. But it means we are declared to be a part of God's family. And so what that means is the mystery that Paul is talking about has been revealed to the Colossians and by extension to us. Now furthermore, in verse 27, Paul tells us that the mystery also has glorious riches. Glory refers to splendor, uh, a, a remarkable ap appearance. And that second word, riches, it refers to abundant riches. In fact, the, the word often has a negative connotation to it because there is like a super abundant of riches. I mean, we would call it filthy rich. And so Paul is saying that whatever this mystery is, it is gloriously abundant. It is so, so good. It's overflowing with goodness. So what's the mystery? Are you ready for the revealing of the mystery? You've already heard it a couple times, actually. Paul says, the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This was a mystery that was hidden for a long, long time, Paul says, but now it's revealed and it is gloriously rich. Well, what is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Christ in you is the teaching that somehow or another, it's possible for Christ to be in us. And with that, comes the hope of glory. So what is Paul saying? Is he saying that when we have Christ in us, we have the hope of eternal life? I mean, we often call heaven uh, our home in glory, or sometimes people just refer to it as glory. You hear about it in the hymns, I'm going to glory. Is that what Paul meant? Yeah, but not only that, it's more. Paul is saying that this glorious richness is that all people have the opportunity to know Christ now, experiencing Christ now in you, he says, in us, which means that there is an astounding gloriousness of riches that we can experience now. But it's also more than that because it's the hope of glory, future glory. This is, this is profound. 
this mystery. Christ in you now, the glorious richness of God in us now, and a hope of future glory. I mean, it's precisely what Jesus described when he said, so he came to give us abundant life and eternal life. Think about the powerful thought that that is. But as I think about that, even though I love that thought, and it, it is really world-changing, I wonder how much we have a genuine sense of these glorious riches in our lives. How much do we actually experience Christ in us? Now, hope of a future glory? Yeah, that is nice. In, in fact, that can put our minds at ease at least for a time. But we live in the here and now. We face struggles and pressures and anxieties here and now. It's nice to have the hope of glory, but Paul is saying that's not all there is. He's saying we should have some experience of Christ in us now. So how about you? Do you experience Christ now? What is Paul actually intending there for us to even experience? Christ in you. Okay, well, what does that mean, Paul? Are we supposed to feel something? Are we supposed to have Jesus' thoughts running through our minds like a voice in our head? Well, if so, why do maybe you and I rarely or, or maybe even never hear that voice? Or is Christ in you something else? I get it. The glorious riches of Christ in you, the hope of glory as Paul reveals this mystery. It really sounds poetic and amazing until we ask that question. What does it feel like or what does it mean? Is it just something we're supposed to believe? These words on a piece of paper but it really has no bearing on our lives? Is it only supposed to be about the hope of glory as if it only matters for eternity in, in the future? What do we do we don't feel like we have much of an experience of Jesus. I've wrestled with this. When I preached last week's sermon, I changed up the ending a bit from the YouTube version to the live version in person. And I mentioned at the end of the live in-person sermon that last week I went on a retreat in daily life, included times of prayer and Bible study, um, just quiet reflection that we did uh, on our own. It wasn't actually a retreat that we went to. It was all done by Zoom. And it included spiritual direction. Monday through Friday, we had our time alone, studying the word, time in prayer, time in quiet. And then we met for 30 minutes with our spiritual director every day, Monday through Friday. I had to admit to my spiritual director that I don't often have a feeling of a present experience of Jesus. How about you? Now hold that thought. Consider that question because Paul continues. He's got more to say about this mystery. Skip ahead a few verses to chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. He tells the, the Colossians he struggles for them so that they can be encouraged in heart, united in love, and experiencing the full riches of complete understanding in order to know the mystery of God, Christ in whom, he says, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, there's the word mystery again. There's the word riches again. This time, though, he says that the riches are complete understanding. He calls them the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Kind of starting to think that our mystery story has turned into a hidden treasure story. They're kind of related, right? The mystery has been revealed. The treasure map has been deciphered, and the treasures are in Christ. And Christ is in you. So all this, uh, this vast riches of understanding and wisdom and knowledge are in Christ, and Christ is in you. Now, by the way, the word you, he uses there, in you, it's plural. In Greek, they have different words for you. In English, we just have you. But they can make it very clear when the writer is talking about just one you or when he's talking about a group of people. In English, we would call that you all. 
But that doesn't mean that just because he's using the plural, you all, that there is no individual understanding here, as if Christ is somehow in a group, but not in the individual. It's both Christ in you individually and Christ in his church collectively. And I think that's where this passage is critical. Christ in you. How is Christ in you? Well, if we go back to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, he says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Christ is in us through his Spirit. That's why Paul talks about wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And he hints at this reason in verse 4. So that... The, Col the Colossians will not be deceived by fine-sounding arguments. Paul's saying, I wrote this letter for a purpose. He has heard troubling news about this group of Christians. They're, they're being deceived by some people who have these fine-sounding arguments. And he wants them to be rooted in Christ, who is in them and in whom are found the glorious riches of wisdom and understanding and knowledge. Paul wants them to know how incredibly important it is that they are convinced of this truth. He wants them to be orderly and firm in their faith, as he says in verse 5. And all of that goes back to a solid understanding of the mystery. Christ in you. It's one thing to intellectually understand these words on the page that Christ is living in us by his Holy Spirit. How do we practice it? How does it matter more than just the hope of glory, but Christ in us now? I'm convinced that in order to grow our relationship with Jesus and with his spirit, it's a practice very similar to how we would cultivate any other relationship. Spending time with the spirit, talking with the spirit, listening to the spirit. You might remember a few years ago, I was on sabbatical. And as I was praying one day, and a lot of wonderful time for time alone in prayer, and I was praying, it hit me one day that I can be really one-sided in my relationship with Jesus. It's kind of like, you know that friend, um, you, you see them, you, you know, you come together and you're like, oh, hey, how are you doing? And it is like that one phrase out of your mouth is, you are opening a door for them to just unload. Have you had that experience before? It's like they just say, yeah, and download on you. And they go on and on. And sometimes it seems like they, they just don't come up for air, divulging their life on you. And you're, you're trying to stay with them, nodding your head, and, and you're trying to keep eye contact with them. And every now and then you're saying, uh-huh, yeah, and then you get to one of those points where you realize, oh my, my thoughts just wandered off. I wonder if they could even see my eyes kind of glaze over because I lost focus even on them. And then you realize, because you lost focus, you didn't actually even hear what they've been saying for the last two, three, four sentences. Even though during that whole time you kept eye contact and maybe even let some, uh-huh, yeah, come out. And so you think to yourself, man, I, I better ask them a clarifying question so that they really do think I'm interested and I'm paying attention to them. But then you think, I don't want to ask them a question because then they're going to take that as me being interested and really keep talking. What I really want to do is get out of this conversation. And so you feel stuck. I mean, you know, it would be dishonest to lead them along. Lead them to thinking that you're actually interested. I mean, you basically would be lying to them. And you also feel guilty because you think inwardly, man, I should really care about this conversation, but I don't. What's wrong with me? And then you think, hold on a second, what's wrong with them? Do they even realize that they have been talking nonstop for 30 minutes and they haven't once asked me how I'm doing? And then it hit me. That's what I do to God all the time in my prayer. I won't shut up. I just talk and talk and talk, endlessly rattling off my list of requests. What kind of a friend am I? 
Never once have I asked the Holy Spirit, how are you doing? Never once have I listened for an answer or cared to, to get to know him. When that first hit me, it was super embarrassing, shameful. I had to confess and repent like, Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit in me, sorry, I haven't been a good friend. I'm sorry, I haven't given hardly any effort to get to know you. Now, of course, that's not totally true because we have the word of God and he speaks through his word and that is super important. But if the mystery is Christ in me and he is in me and in him are the glorious riches of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and yes, that is all in him then we would do well to get to know him. Yes, through our study of his word, absolutely, but also through the spirit in us, the actual him in us. So think about it. When Paul wrote this, these people didn't have Bibles to read. Only the exceedingly wealthy person could own some scrolls, and those scrolls weren't even the whole Bible. Not to mention the fact that the New Testament was in the process of being written. When he wrote Colossians, there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. None of them. You couldn't get to know Jesus in the Gospels because the Gospels didn't exist. Well, of course, they had stories and maybe some other writings and notes, but none of the Gospels, nothing like what we have. So how did they get to know Jesus? Yeah, it was the stories, but it wasn't by opening a Bible. They got to know Christ in you, the hope of glory, in a personal way. I wonder if they asked, how are you doing, Jesus? I wonder if they learned to listen to the voice of his spirit. Oh, I get it. That's another mystery. At least it can, it can feel like a mystery. The spirit moves in mysterious ways as the song goes. As a spirit, there is an inherent mystery in his being, his voice, uh, to the idea that he lives in us. It is a mystery, but we can get to know him, learn to hear his voice, walk in step with the spirit, allowing the spirit to fill and control us so the fruit of the spirit flows out of us. And so to make progress in this, I urge you to give the spirit your time, your energy, your friendship. Yes, you can pray and, and talk, ab absolutely, but also listen. Listen for him in the word of God. Listen in nature and from other people and, and in that voice of the spirit. If you're not sure about whether you've heard something from the spirit, check it according to the word of God because it'll line up with scripture. Maybe still not sure. This is why I have found just recently in the last week why a spiritual director can be so important. And I also think Christian mature friends as well can be a lot like that. But I saw in that retreat this practice of discerning together. And I'm going to continue it. We're now going to be meeting once a month. A spiritual director can help you discern the spirit, Christ in you. It takes practice, it takes time, it takes commitment, but that's just like any relationship. And so, the mystery is revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's practice growing a relationship deeper and truer with Christ in you. Lord, thank you so much for this amazing truth. You didn't just give us life and, and then make a way for us to experience abundant and eternal life. It, it, it cost you. Think about Jesus, life, death, and resurrection and how amazing it is. But then there is the revealing of the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to relate to us like that, close to us. I pray that you would help us to get to know you more deeply, that we might be more faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us again. If you'd like to learn more about Faith Church, please do check us out online. Our website is findfaithhere.org. 
can learn about uh, the life and family of Faith Church, get in contact with us. Um, and if you'd like to join us for worship, you are more than welcome, uh, both in person or online. We have worship by Zoom on Sunday mornings, and we'd be glad to talk with you further about this sermon or anything else. Thank you.